The Bain Free Radio Hour. On the podcast, zombified chicken and petrified waffles on the menu for Vegas's new Apocalypse Diner. Freaky Friday's coming on which the lighted end of a match suddenly has a shadow. Plus, we continue with the complete audiobook serialization of Larry Correa's Son of the Black Sword, all right now. Welcome to the Bain Free Radio Hour podcast. It's an honor to have you along. I'm Bain Senior Editor Tony Daniel. We talk with DJ Butler and Aaron Michael Ritchie this time about their Great Depression-era fantasy novel, The Cunning Man. This book is set in the Great American West, where a mining camp is shut down because a mine might be haunted. People are desperate. Families are starving. Then along comes a cunning man. Is his magic real, and can it save them? Not even the cunning man knows for sure, so that interview's coming up. And we continue with the complete audiobook serialization of Larry Correa's great high fantasy novel, Son of the Black Sword. Now here's the news. Look up in the sky, winging along like slightly word-heavy ravens. It's the November Mass Markets coming to booksellers. Out now in Mass Market is The Valley of Shadows by John Ringo and Mike Massa. The zombies are at the gates in New York, and it's up to corporate head of security Tom Smith to make sure humanity stands a chance against the ravenous horde. Good thing Smith, late of the Australian Special Forces, isn't a man who gives up easily. Also out in November is Conflict of Honors by Sharon Lee and Steve Miller. Now an experienced officer assigned to the Leaden vessel Daxflan, Priscilla Delacroix e Mendoza has been abandoned by her captain and shipmates, left to fend for herself on a distant planet. But Priscilla is not alone. Starship Captain Shan Yoskalen has his own score to settle with Dax Flan, but confronting the sinister crew will be far easier than confronting the demons of Priscilla's own mysterious past. The Valley of Shadows by John Ringo and Mike Massa and Conflict of Honors by Sharon Lee and Steve Miller are now available in mass market paperback format at booksellers everywhere. Want to welcome DJ Butler and Aaron Michael Ritchie to the podcast. Hey, fellows. Hello. DJ Dave Butler grew up in swamps, deserts, and mountains. After messing around for years with the practice of law, he finally got serious and turned to his lifelong passion of storytelling. He now writes adventure stories for readers of all ages, plays guitar, and spends as much time as he can with his family. He is, although he's in Minneapolis at the moment, I believe, uh, he is the author of City of the Saints, uh, Rock Band Fights Evil, Space Eldritch, um, The Crashling from Worldfire Press, and Witchy Eye, Witchy Winter, and uh, Witchy Kingdom from Bain Books. Aaron Michael Ritchie is the author of 21 novels and numerous pieces of short fiction. He was born on a cold and snowy November day in Denver, Colorado, and while he's lived and traveled all over the world, he's a child of the American West. Sagebrush makes him homesick. While he pines for the road, he still lives in Colorado with his cactus flower of a wife and two stormy daughters. Is that a broken analogy or does that work a stormy day all right now at booksellers everywhere is the cunning man yes yeah 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 i see so that just applies to them no matter what other allegory you're using right. now at booksellers everywhere is the cunning man by dj butler and aaron michael ritchie um this is a Really, it, it's a historical fantasy. Um, it feels sort of contemporary to me in that, uh, I, I don't know, I mean, all these people feel like uh, folks that uh, that are like people I know. So uh, I guess we could call it historical fantasy. Um, what is a cunning man? Somebody, why don't you all define what a cunning man is? Uh, sure. So a cunning man, so... Um 
the, the root of this book really started, so Dave and I were talking about uh, folk magic, American folk magic, and in which he does a great job of, of adding in actual folk magic uh, that came to America from Europe. And so um, we were talking about um, the Mormonism and folk magic and, and, uh, and, and how it's so interesting is for, mo- for like much of Christianity, you would go to church on Sunday and you would pray to God. And then on Monday, you would cast spells. And a cunning man, or, or the cunning folk, are people who have a deep understanding of magic, uh, and of American magic, which is really based in Christianity. So you would, and, and what's interesting is my, uh, my mother just cast a, forced my wife to cast this spell, because we, we needed to sell my father-in-law's townhome. And um, so... We, we followed the components of the spell. So we took a statue of St. Joseph. You bury it upside down in the, in the yard of the house you want to sell. And then you whisper a prayer that summons God and Jesus to help you sell this house. And I was like, this is, ridic- this is a spell. And my mom was like, no, 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 it works. It works. It's not a spell. And I'm like, really? That sounds like a spell to me. I just wrote a book two books about this. So, yeah, so that's what a cunning man is. So, and I guess my mom is, is of the cunning folk. We did sell the condo. We did sell the townhome. So it worked. There you have it. Apparently it worked. Is the St. Joseph still buried upside down, or did you take him with you? No, so that was awkward. Confess to a crime, Tony. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was awkward. We, you know, we sold it, and then my mom is like, "Well, did you? I want my statue of Saint Joseph back." And so, me and my daughter had to go over there with his shovel um, when the people weren't home to dig up the Saint Joseph. It was it was like a scene out of our book, right? I mean, I was just like, "Oh my God, I feel like Hiram Woolley." <laughs> Wow, that's deeply troubling. So, uh, tell tell me tell us a little bit more about the origin of y'all y'all working together on this since you brought it up, uh, Aaron. Uh, how did how did it come about that you, that you two decided to write this book, and uh, how do you know each other? Well, we've known oh, wow. each other so for we... years. Yeah, you go, Dave. Oh, okay. Well, my voice may give out a little hoarse, but uh, so so I I've known Aaron. Uh, we've been we, we've known each other for years. Uh, years meaning I don't know, but four five years. Um, and uh, we met uh, because we both uh, for several years traveled uh, with a traveling bookstore at conventions called the Bard's Tower. Well, originally it was uh, Kevin Anderson's Wordfire uh, store. The the booth manifestation of his Wordfire Press publishing company, and they came to Bard's Tower, and so so we knew each other from uh, traveling and selling books together, um, and, uh, and I invited Aaron uh, um, early on to a spring writing retreat at my house. I live in this um, big old house. Uh, a eight bedroom house, uh, and my family's not that big, so we have these. We have several guest bedrooms, and so in the spring, uh, I have a, a host a writing retreat there, and uh, sort of uh, true to my style, it's an anarcho libertarian kind of event. Uh, I don't try and charge anybody or make rules. You come, and the the, the only structure is. Uh, the only payment to get in is you, you make a one meal for everybody uh, during the week, and the only structure is that you can't bother people until dinner time. So you just you get up and you write all day, and then after after dinner, people socialize or play games or whatever. Um, and it would have been I don't know two and a half years ago or so uh, at, at this retreat uh, that Aaron and I uh, started tossing around. We're, we're t- talking about story ideas. And came up with the idea for uh, for these these stories set in the Great Depression about a 
an, an American, uh, specifically about a, a Mormon wizard in, in the 1930s, having uh, kind of pulp-style um, uh, arcane adventures. Uh, and at the time, uh, at the time, there was no immediate realistic possibility we would uh, that we would sell them anywhere. So it was sort of, hey, let's do this. That would be fun. That sounds that sounds great. Uh, and then about six months later, when I went uh, to pitch to Tony B. W. Um, next writing projects uh, that I that I might do, uh, I sent her a list of five things, and this was one of them. Uh, and, and Aaron and I spent a lot of time on the phone discussing the pitch. And every time we had a call talk about the pitch, we said, there's no way that they're going to go for this one. But, you know, we had these five things that Dave has put together. There's no way this is going to be the one that gets, that gets sold. Uh, and, yeah, Mormon and, Sorcerer. Yeah, they're going to go with the Mormon Sorcerer book. Yeah. And, uh, and yet it was. <laughs> So, so, uh, so we wrote it. And Dave and I really bonded because Dave is um, Dave grew up religious, and I grew up religious. He was Mormon, I was Catholic. Um, well, he he we 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 are. He is Mormon, I am Catholic. And it was really kind of our love of talking about you know religion and God and and um, all of these all of these themes, and also being in the modern age, right? Being being kind of a postmodern religious man. And I was really impressed because Dave, I really saw Dave, he's like the Jesuit of the Mormon because he's so educated and he's so like, he just, he has such great theology. And so, yeah, we really bonded right away. And then we yeah. started talking and we're like, what if, and the idea we came up, so we, we were talking about like American folk magic and, um, and it really started off as kind of a pulpy idea. Because we would be like higher bully in the in the Jupiter Knights and high, you know, and then it kind of mellowed. And then I I, I was watching uh, Twin Peaks season three, um, the the new Dave, the new Twin Peaks from David Lynch, and I was like, Dave, let's make this weird. I love David Lynch, so so yeah, so it just kind of like went from there. Yeah, well, it kind of has a blend of. I mean, there's there's a lot of action in here, and it is um, pulpy in a way, but it's also um, it's also got a like you say a certain literary quality, perhaps. Um, I found it really uh, a, a wonderful combination. Um, it's certainly not obscure like Lynch, though. I wouldn't call it call it that. Um, I I think it's it's really accessible, um, and yet. Uh, I don't know. Well, let's talk about Hiram some more, because um, he's 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 an underpowered wizard when we first meet him, um, isn't he? Tell us a little bit about his character. Oh uh, yeah, he's um. So one of our fears was we we really wanted to stick close with with actual magic. So uh, I read a so Dave sent me an actual grimoire. And being a good Catholic boy, I was like, oh, my God, I have a spell book in my house. Um, and, and and one of our fears was is that, you know, we'd get, we'd get feedback saying, yeah, he needs to cast fireballs. And we're like, yeah, he's not that kind of wizard, right? So we really um, stuck close to using actual spells, actual magic. Um, and he's a uh, – and – Dave and I are older and, and, and with families, and, and we didn't want to have some, you know, brash 20-year-old. We, we really wanted to have kind of an established man. So he's in his 40s. He's a beet farmer because that's sexy. And um, he, uh, he, he lost his wife, and so he's, uh, he's a father. He, uh, he fought in the Great War, and he adopted his best friend's uh, Navajo son because his best friend was killed in, in the Great War. And so he really is this very good kind of upstanding man with kind of a tragic backstory. Um, and he has this deep belief in God because the way the magic system works is his spells won't work if he's not right with God. And so he fasts and he's, you know, he does charitable works and he's, um, but and, but it's interesting because there's a great dynamic because we we can talk about that in a minute. But there's a great dynamic between Hiram, who's 
you know, very traditional and very to it in a sense, cause, but he's also an outsider because, you know, in the modern age, you can't really, uh, unless you're my mom, you can't really be casting spells and, you know, in a closed community that, that sees magic with a suspicious eye, kind of a more kind of modern way of looking at it. But he has a, but Hiram has a, his son is, and we said it in the 30s because we really wanted to have it be this kind of, tr- you know, going from the old world to the new, right? We have the rise of, you know, atomic power and we have kind of, you know, the, the, the rule of science. And that really is encapsulated by his son, Michael, who is, who wants to be a scientist, who flirts with atheism. So it's, it, I, I think we created a really interesting dynamic. Yeah, one of my one of my favorite parts of the story is the fact that um, so on the one hand there's a lot of um, if you are used to reading urban fantasy a lot of sort of the structure and how things work will feel like an urban fantasy novel to you. Um, it is about a character who uh, you know encounters a magical menace, uh, spends time investigating to figure out what it is, and then has to confront it. Um, but we say we 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 bend a lot of the way those books work, and one of the ways we do it is there is um, there is only just the tiniest hint of a romantic subplot, and it fails. It goes nowhere. The principal <laughs> relationship plot is not romantic. It's a father son dynamic, and I, and I love. I love working. Aaron and I are both fathers, and 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 I love writing and working in that relationship where Michael is just smart as hell, and um, and really loves Hiram, but also really really challenges him. Uh, and they're different uh, in 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 a lot of ways. And they, and um, as Aaron was kind of talking about, they sort of stand together. They 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 bridge a. a uh, transition between worlds, um, and uh, and I, I love the banter between those two characters. Yeah, it's, well, tell us a little bit more about Michael. Um, he, I mean, he is no Tonto. He's um, he's kind of the opposite. He's uh, like you say, he's the voice of the future in a way. He's the he's all about reason, and uh, he's he's pretty pretty much not going to let anybody uh, uh, get away with um, treating him badly because of his heritage. Tell us, tell us some more about Michael and uh, describe this uh, dynamic a little bit more because it is, it sort of informs, it's the heart of the book. And, and like Dave says, so uh, Hiram is try has kept his, so Michael kind of knows his father does spells, but kind of not. He knows his father is superstitious, and so he just kind of discounts it as superstition. Um, and so he he's you know the nice thing about being an adolescent they have a they have a, a ideas of like right and wrong right there's there there's there's justice and there's fairness, and so Michael really has that young point of view. Whereas Hiram has fought in a war, has lost his wife, um, his own family. His father was a bigamist who, who abandoned his mother, who then disappeared. Um, and so Hiram, Hiram kind of has more compassion, I think, for people. And Michael is like, no, nope, that guy's an ass. Uh, and, and the other thing is Hiram is he's not really very good with, like, people. Like, he's, he's, he's very introverted and and kind of awkward. Um, and Michael is really, uh, is the person who, who does a lot of the interrogating and talking, but he, Mike, Michael also just will say what he has no filter. So he'll just kind of say whatever is on the top of his head, you know, not really, not really caring. Um, so he was just such a fun character to write. And both of them together have this great dynamic because they're both very funny and they both like they're they're friends, but then there's also the parent child, and that's one of the challenges of being a parent is when do you when do you let your kid kind of be your kid, and when do you try to correct them? And 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 Hiram struggles with that in, in the book as well. Yeah, and that's 
<clears throat> at, at all levels um, from sort of uh, trying to uh, to sort of just at the at the at the fringes restrain Michael from socially awkward things, you know, um, to sort of trying to help him not get too self indulgent with uh, uh, with you know cussing, for example, to trying to help Michael not get um, in serious trouble because he will open his mouth and and call people on things. I, one way I sort of think about them as we're writing them is, is Hiram's uh, just been wounded, and so he's got a lot more restraint. He's a very self-restrained character, uh, and, uh, and and Michael hasn't learned that, yet. And so he will uh, he will punch immediately, not really thinking about the consequences. So we have this great sort of duo who um, who are off on an adventure. What is all right? So what's the story? Uh, set it up. Where? How do they end up in this mining camp? Um, who is Bishop Wells, and what is he asking Hiram to do at the beginning of the book? Uh, just tell us a little bit about the, you know, the first, the start of the story. So um, uh, Hiram's got a, a ministry, uh, and and his ministry, Hiram. So one way, uh, one way to think about him as a character is to ask the question: What does a what does a paladin look like in the 1930s? Right? What does what does someone look like who really who exu- who is mission driven, who really wants to do good? Um, he uh, and he is mission driven. He he wants to help the poor, widows, widows and orphans. That's that's right. Um, there's an early conversation with a character named Gus Dollar in the book, and Gus sort of psychoanalyzes Hiram a bit and says, "Ah, oh, I see. You were you were abandoned by your own father, and you want to make sure no one else is ever abandoned." And Hiram says, uh, says "No, it's just the right thing to do, right?" Um, so, uh, so he's a farmer, but in the seasons where he doesn't have to be planting uh, or harvesting. Uh, Hiram uh, Hiram helps the poor. So uh, there's a there's an institution in the Mormon Church called the Presiding Bishopric, and what they do is they oversee material things. So uh, in in actual history, at this period of time, it's in the second half of the 1930s that they are starting to figure out how to have a church-wide welfare system. It's sort of become one of the things the LDS is famous for, right? But it's, it's at this time they are just beginning to figure it out. So, uh, who who Bishop Wells is? Is he's one of the three men who are in this presiding bishopric? And this is a to the real historical person, although we've taken some gigantic liberties with him, um, which his family hopefully does not know about. Uh, so. Uh, <laughs> The uh, the idea is that you got um, that, that Hiram it functions like a sort of unofficial assistant to these guys. So they haven't yet figured out how to really run a welfare system, but they're also trying to deal with sort of still on ad hoc basis. How do we how do we help the bankrupted uh, farmer? How do we help the people with the where the bank has closed because of a bank run? How do we deal with the family that's falling out over a will? How do, how do we help them? And one of their ad hoc answers is, you know, Hiram is a kind of an errand boy um, for them. Um, so there, there is some authentic historical context. John Wells really was the second counselor and the presiding bishopric. Um, and then from there, we've taken real liberties. Because what we've done is we've got the presiding bishop himself, so the number one of these three men is off the stage. And then we've we've taken the number two and the number three, and we've done what uh, we've made sort of cop show cliches a little bit out of them. In that we've made them the bad lieutenant and the good sergeant. So so John Wells is the good sergeant uh, who will who will run interference for Hiram and try to keep him from being in too much trouble and is sympathetic to him and understands his background in folk magic because John Wells also here this is fictional has a similar experience in his youth in England. Um, 
whereas the number two guy is David Smith, and he's sort of the bad lieutenant. And he is also a vision of the future. He's the sort of mechanized welfare system that's going to come into play and ultimately replace the kind of things uh, that Hiram is doing. And he is suspicious of anything that sounds like magic or is associated with crime, um, which Hiram inevitably, it, it, people say, this guy came and he casts spells and he gets, you know, he gets involved in uh, in murders and he becomes the suspect. And so he's always kind of walking, like in a good cop show, right, where the where the the detective is always sort of in trouble with the lieutenant, but the sergeant saves him. But but this is the last time, right? Um, it's it's that dynamic. Uh, in an enthusiastical context. Tell us about the um, the Kimball family mine and and who the people are that they send Hiram to help it initially and how he gets involved with the Kimballs. So Hiram is sent. Also on one of his missions, he's sent to bring food to the Kimball mine. So the Kimball mine um, uh, is a coal mine in uh, Utah outside of Helper. Which we went to. So I, I flew out, uh, Dave and I hung out, and we um, drove down to Helper, Utah, scenic Helper. And we, uh, Dave had already been friends with Jason. What's his last name, Jason? Huntinger. Jason Huntinger. Huntinger. At the, uh, at, there's, a, there's a museum in Helper about the railroad and about coal mining. And so we went, we went to that museum, which had just, you know, fabulous information on, on coal mining and, and the railroad, because um, uh, at that time, Helper was like, was like a boom town and was, was really the industrial capital of Utah. And so Hiram goes to the Kimball Mine, the Kimball Mine is closed, and he brings them food, which includes beets, because who doesn't like beets? And um, and he realizes that if he really wants to help them, he has to get the Kimball mine open. But then there's three siblings who are all fighting, and they have different ideas of what to do with the mine, and they're at each other's throats. So really the story is um, Hiram figuring out why this family is in ruin and what the truth is, because there's, you know, the... And during the time, there was all different nationalities working in the mine. So the Greeks are saying, you know, it's haunted. We shouldn't go in there. We have this, the Danish foreman says, you know, um, there's still coal there because, you know, there's rumors that the coal's all gone. He's like, no, there's coal there. They just, you know, one one of the brothers wants to, to dig in a different place, the other one. So it's really this kind of, and and the way the mining system worked is that you you were you rented your little house and you went to the company store and you were beholden to the mining company. And if you didn't work, you, you still were charged. And so the camp is just becoming more and more desperate. And, you know, these are, this is the Great Depression. So finding another, you're probably not going to be able to find another job. And so it's this, and so things get more and more intense as the days go by and, you know, Hiram's in a race to figure out what's going on. And he realizes there's a supernatural component. Well, let's, uh, let's go back to the mind being haunted. What are, what are the possible monsters in this world? And um, what, what might Hiram need, have to confront? Well, first of all, there's other wizards. We, we could talk about that a little bit. And, but there are monsters, uh, yeah, so so the way this world works is is witches were a big thing. So there was a movie that came out. Um, the guy's second movie, The Lighthouse, is out, and I'm dying to see it. I, I, Ed, Ed, Edgers, right? Edgers? That's his last name. Um, and so the, the movie The Witch really showed, you know, this family being, being um, tortured by a witch. And so in our world, witches are real, and they prey on people, and um, they need to be dealt with. So... So Hiram has to figure out, okay, is there a witch involved? Now, and, and the, thing about, the thing about kind of the old world way of looking is you weren't quite sure what supernatural entity you're dealing with. You don't know if it's a ghost. You don't know if it's a devil or a demon. And you don't know if it's an angel, right? Because there's no, 
there's no kind of like monster manual to consult. So, you know, you're you're dealing with the haunted mine, and so Hiram says, okay, is it a witch? Is it a ghost? Is there a demon? Or, or are there, and then there, he hears rumors of, of antlered men, uh, you know, um, you know, uh, running th- through the countryside. So it really is him ha- having to kind of figure this out and, and seeing, because he, he realizes there's another wizard, but he doesn't know if the wizard is good or bad. And it's him trying to figure that out as well. Yeah. Well, we, we meet the, another wizard. Go ahead, Dave. Sorry. Oh, I was just kidding. I was going to say, <clears throat> uh, the, um, the, the the world this is set in, uh, as much as possible, we'd like it to be our world, right? That is to say, this is not a world which most people encounter or experience monsters in a way that they um, that they notice. There aren't races of, you know, fairies or ubiquitous kinds of things. So as much as possible, we want to sort of draw the monsters and the strangeness uh, from from um, the draw tight circles around, sort of sort of small and hidden in the world, and also draw it from real sort of uh, early, early modern uh, um, magical kind of experience. So there's the, there's the demon in the first book, uh, and in the second book, which we're we're close to submitting uh, the draft. Uh, there's a there's a cult, um, but these are things that are hidden in in our world rather than being a you know rampant in a different world. Well, and that makes it kind of scarier because it feels like uh, you know we're in our reality in this in this tale. Well, let's talk about a little bit about the magical uh, the magic that Hiram uses is English. Um, there's also some German magic. Or is it a concatenation of the two? What what is it that's uh, that that he knows from his aunt Hetty or his grandma Hetty? And our other wizard is Gus Dollar, um, who runs a gas station, um, and he has his own. Mat- I mean, this happens very early in the story, so we're not giving much away here. Um, tell us tell us about the magic, and tell us about the Jupiter ring in particular. Yeah, one of the uh, one of the fun things about the first book is that one way to see it, um, and this is kind of what the title is really alluding to, is that the whole thing, it, it, as Aaron said, if you get away from Fireball and you say if we have characters cast spells such as we find in the actual books, and Aaron's got a couple of grimoires, but I got a couple of spells full. Um, uh, can you still have a wizard's duel? And what does a wizard's duel look like? And <laughs> and one way to see the book is that the whole thing, from basically chapter two to the second to last chapter, is one protracted <laughs> duel. Um, <laughs> men, Hiram Woolley, uh, the sugar beet farmer who learned his grandma had his traditional folk math, principally English. Gus Dollar, who is a um, who who really has all the advantages. Um, Hiram's Hiram's magic is mostly verbal. He has extremely limited uh, magical uh, resources. He doesn't have spell books. There are various famous uh, spell books he's heard of. He would love to have. He doesn't have them. He mostly has kind of fragments that uh, that his grandma taught him. He in fact doesn't have some of his grandma's lore, because she was a very strict reader of the almanac and knew her astrology quite well. And that piece actually eludes Hiram, which which sort of comes into play in book two. He has only very simple kind of understanding of stuff. Whereas Gus has a lot of books, and sort of the more, um, the more uh, literate and kind of court-based magical resources from the high renaissance that Hiram would love to have and envious of. Um, so Hiram's magic is principally, uh, the cunning folk were, were English, 
They were your middle class white hat wizards who were artisans, um, and that's and that's the kind of magic that Hiram knows. And it doesn't have a very uh, strict theoretical basis. It's eclectic. It's it's charms uh, that uh, that that. that but if th- these are the things that worked. Hiram says a couple points in the book. You know, I know how to do things that work. I know, I know what works. Um, whereas what Gus does is more uh, theoretical. When Gus is engaged, Hi- Hiram appears as an annoyance to Gus, and Gus is engaged in a, in a different contest entirely. When Hiram walks on the scene and disrupts what Gus is up to. Um, and Gus is attempting to uh, gain power by, um, uh, again, without going into spoilers, with sort of with sort of engaging in more literate, more theoretical, more written kind of Renaissance uh, style magic. So yeah, Hiram's stuff is mostly English, uh, but we also gave him a uh, some uh, some of uh, some of the charms. Uh, traditional German folk magic that is practiced in America. Um, uh, so he knows a few of, of John George Homan's uh, charms, although he says them in English rather than German. So uh, talk about the uh, Jupiter ring. That's uh, that's one of his key uh, artifact possessions. So uh, so Hiram has kind of these these magic items. That were that he finds, or were, pa- were pa- mostly passed down from Grandma Hetty, and he has his trusty uh, heliotropus, which is a bloodstone. And Dave is such a great guy. After we finished it, we were at Dragon Con, and he bought me a heliotropus. And so now, I, whenever I travel, I, I have it with me always because it protects it. It it stops it it stops bleeding. It staunches bleeding. It uh, helps me detect if anybody is lying. So if you're around me. You have to tell the truth. And it also um, brings me fame and luck. So in our book, he uses the heliotropus to, as a kind of a lie detector test. But again, it's only if he is kind of right with God. Uh, his Saturn ring, um, and we do a little bit of astrology, because again, this is kind of a melting pot. So, so unlike Gus Dollar, who grew up in Germany and had access to books. Um, and a lot of the, the spell books that we have are people wrote them and says, you know, to say, this is what a witch looks like and this is what a witch does and these are the spells. But don't do them because you'll burn in hell. Um, so it's ironic that we have spell books written by people who <laughs> were trying to stop witches. But... Um, so Hiram's is kind of magic is kind of a collection of astrology and stories and prayers. And, um, you know, he says names that he doesn't really understand, but he, he does whatever works. And so one of the things that he was born under the, uh, he was born under the star uh, under Saturn. And so that gives him very vivid dreams. And so that ring, the Saturn ring kind of uh, makes his dreams a lot more vivid and kind of gives him kind of a, a divination edge that we use a little bit in the book. And he also has, what else does he have? So he has the heliotrope. Oh, he has the Chiro amulet, which, um, yes. Cairo, which, which the Cairo, I always say Chiro cause it's the CH. Um, yeah. but yeah, so that gives him magical protection. Uh, I think it, it, and, you know, so at one point he, he shot at, and it, and it doesn't, and it only grazes him. And he's like, oh, my Cairo amulet's working. But, but you don't know, right? So in real magic, so my, you know, we sold our house because of the St. Joseph statue. If we didn't have it, would we have sold the townhome? Probably. But who's to say, right? So in our, the way our magic is that certain things happen, and, and Hiram's like, that's probably my magic, but I'm not sure, but I'm going to have faith. Well, it's probably the, the heliotropus and not the St. Joseph statue that did it. Truth. <laughs> well, that's how come Dave and I are, are so famous, because we have our heliotropus. Um, yeah. But the other thing that was interesting, I had no, I, I had no idea until you know, Dave and I researched this book, is layman's. And layman's are these pieces of paper or hammered tin 
that you inscribe, and they're basically, again, for protection. So he, in, in their old, you know, double-A truck, they have, he has a layman of, like, beaten tin, I think. Is it tin or is that paper in the side? Uh, it's, it's, uh, ooh, suddenly I'm not sure. I thought it was paper, but actually it might, it might be a piece of tin inside the door. But, but it's these inscriptions where you have, and again, you know, you could, you know, read a book or, or you can have somebody say, show you and you write these magic words. Um, like abracadabra is like a real magic word, right? We, we use it as kind of like fun magic. But back in the day, you know, 300 years ago in England, they, they had this abracadabra chart that you would write the word abra, and then, I mean, it's this whole kind of matrix. But, yeah, so the layman's also, um, they use to protect them against evil spirits and ghosts and demons. and So, yeah, it's, it's fascinating. And it's fascinating how we, a lot of this is lost, that, that, that we've just now kind of like in the modern age. And that's one of the themes we talk about is kind of the, the world has become more known and there's less mystery, and there's a loss there. There's, there's, and it's kind of this melancholy loss. Well, let's talk a little bit more about the uh, some of the secondary characters who are fascinating. The thing that Hiram's really good at is is getting people to open up. That's one of the fun parts of the book is that we get really into some of the backstories of these people and why they are the way they are. Um, maybe uh, talk about the Kimball triangle. Um, I want to bring in our, um, our dastardly, uh, railroad man, Naaman Reddig and Mary McGill also is, uh, uh, Mary McGill. Uh, so Dave and I, when we started this, um, we were, we were really, um, when we started this, we, we so we're going to co-write a book. So we did a we did a, a outline, and I like to save the cat format. And then we did chapter by chapter, and we also did uh, character sketches. And so in the character sketches, we just kind of again we we liked having them have kind of an odd, just something odd about them. So um, so Mary McGill has like a like a like a red birthmark on her face. Um, and she was a uh, the daughter of a, a, a union guy because again this is like in the you know the teens you had the wobblies and you had the you know the kind of the rise of the labor unions and so she really kind of is a working for the for the for the downtrodden and so she um, you know is, is you know wants to make sure that the labor law is passed in, in on mines. Like the child labor laws are, are respected, and the miners themselves are like, you know, Mike Klaus is a good boy. He works. You know, why do you not want him to work? Um, but she was a great character because she's uh, Roman Catholic, and so um, she gets arrested, and, and, and so she's saying the rosary in jail, and and she is, and and so I think she respects, and the 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 little understated romance is so sweet because Hiram is just like, yeah, the, um, you know, and both of them like respect each other and there's this kind of attraction, but they never, they never, they never uh, act on it. But, and then the, the railroad guy is, so one of the things we wanted to do, because really this reads like a mystery, right? We we're trying to figure out kind of, why the Kimball mine is shut down. We have a, we have a murder uh, midway through. And so one of the, one of the mysterious uh, characters that we, that we um, want to put as a suspect is also the evil railroad baron, who is this kind of overbearing, you know, kind of um, who wants the land that the Kimball mine is on. So he has a definite motive, um, to, to to pit the the sibling against each other. I was going to say the thing about Redding uh, Redding was that he he reminded me of that great character from uh, the second season of Deadwood, I believe it was. Uh, that was uh, it was basically uh, moving in trying to take over the the town. He and he's 
in similar way, he's he's very slick on the outside, so that you and seems to be a uh, Mister Civic minded guy, um, at least on first glance. So he he he's a really good character, and he kind of fools Hiram a little bit at first. No, and so that again, so he was a character we kind of introduced, and you're not quite sure kind of how he plays into this. So he's the he's he's the he's the um, unknown quantity that is then kind of you know as the book progresses, you know you start like in any good mystery, right? You you say okay, we think it's this, and then it wasn't, and you're like oh okay, now I see his motivation, and so then we kind of like see okay, what what really is going on? Um, until we until we get to the until we get to the end where you're like oh. We'll talk about the Kimballs a little bit. They are Mormons, um, and they are the owners of the mine. And there's three of them. There's Ammon, Eliza, and Samuel. Yeah, and they are the children of, of uh, Tiankum Kimball. And Tiankum Kimball is not a real person. Uh, there, is a, there is a real family, a real Kimball family. Uh, Utah has a kind of a Mormon aristocracy in certain family names. This is less and less true all the time, but you know, in the 19th and early 20th centuries, it was still true that certain family names uh, were just tied in with with the, the leadership. Um, and and Kimball was one of them. Um, the Ankum Kimball is, is modeled on a real guy, though, who was the founder of the town of Helper, whose name was Tiankum Pratt. Pratt is a is a different one of the kind of Mormon aristocracy names, and. Um, Yankum Pratt is tragic. Uh, he uh, he comes down to settle helper, and uh, he and he he can't succeed. He tries farming for a while. Farming fails. He sells his land to uh, mine companies, um, and ultimately he is as an old man working in the mines, and falls down one of these mine shafts in a mine on the land he used to own. He the, the town founder and breaks his neck. Uh, that that's a real guy, um, and he's he's ultimately the the person we modeled this character on. Tiankum Kimball is missing uh, when uh, and then presumed dead. Uh, rumors that maybe he ran off with the youngest of his polygamous wives, right? Um, and uh, because there there are people still in the early 20th century, although polygamy is outlawed as of the early 1890s, there are people. Uh, really up until about this time, who are still more or less openly practicing polygamy uh, in Utah. Tiankum has been uh, has been one of them. So he has three children by three different wives, um, and uh, he's out of the picture now, and the three, the three children cannot agree on what to do with the mine. Um, the oldest is uh, moved away, and is, a, is the daughter, Eliza. She teaches school. And uh, and she remembers her childhood back before there were mines, before there was this railroad stuff, when we were just ranchers, and uh, and 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 wants to take the land back to uh, ranching, to cattle and sheep and goats. Um, and then there's the uh, the son Ammon, uh, who is a big sort of bull-like character, who is. Uh, fundamentally dutiful. He wants to operate the family mind. He is also very bullheaded, doesn't believe anybody can uh, uh, tell him uh, what to do. And then it's just, we just need to keep operating the mind the way it's always been operating. Uh, and then the youngest uh, brother named Samuel, who is a uh, pothead. Uh, and when we see him uh, initially, uh, it's pretty clear he's uh, weird. Um, but but as as we see him more and more, he seems to be, um, in fact, maybe insane uh, or uh, or possessed, um, and uh, who uh, feels that the mind needs to be uh, that he's been given a vision uh, that uh, he thinks his brother Ammon shares, um, because he and Ammon are both being manipulated by a supernatural power. Um, without saying too much around spoilers, uh, that, that wants them to fight. 
but he uh, he believes the existing shafts need to be abandoned and you need to uh, dig new uh, dig new shafts in a sort of speculative location that he he's identified through his visionary means. Um, and it's not it's not a hundred percent clear who owns the mine. Uh, and uh, they're they're uh, so the three of them uh, fight, and because the brothers each have certain sections of the the miners lined up with them, there's a there's a there's a violence threat that that leads to a real deadlock, and and the mine is paralyzed, and that's the basic problem Hiram sets himself to try to solve. Hey, I brought food for these miners, and it's going to last just a couple of days. If I don't actually help get the mine open, then these guys are going to jump the rails and go away looking for work, and families are going to be abandoned, and people are going to um, people are going to really suffer. Yeah, it's a wonderful setup and a wonderful uh, a, a wonderful tale of uh, magic in the Depression era times. Um, and there's going to be a, there's going to be more. Uh, you alluded to what uh, what are y'all working on right now? So, um, in the Jupiter Knife, uh, I'm a, I'm a big fan of Moab, and so um, we we the the Jupiter Knife is set in uh, Moab, Utah, in the 30s, and um, there's a great there's a great kind of like folk history of Moab called cow pokes and bike spokes, and uh, I I'm a big mountain biker, and so I I love mountain biking in Moab, and so I picked up that book and and read it and. Um, Dave and I talked, and so we came up with this with a story um, that is that is really it's so it starts off as a ghost story and then moves into kind of the secrets of a small town type of uh, type of thing, um, and it's really fun because in the second one, it's um, we 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 introduce a femme fatale, and so Hiram has to uh, kind of. Um, match well it's not match wits but he's his magic is disrupted <laughs> because of his uh, attraction to this woman um and michael uh, plays more of a um a, like a more active role uh in the in the second one and it's 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 really it was a lot of fun to write what's yeah, that dave he's, he's pretty yeah, i was gonna say he's pretty active in book one the 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 well, so, so there's a little bit of spoilers in this, but but what happens in book two is um, Michael has now discovered what his father's up to. In book one, Hiram's hiding everything from him. My, Michael can barely tolerate the fact that his father believes in God. Certainly not does not know that his father is a practicing wizard, right? So so Hiram wants his son to be protected. So not only was Hiram wear a Cairo amulet, he's got one uh, in the heel of Michael's boot. Right to try and protect him in the same way Hiram's protected without Michael's knowledge. So, but in book two, Michael takes on a sort of an apprentice role, and we see more chapters from his point of view. And he's sort of, you know, I've seen enough things that I can't really say I that I I can't really doubt as much as I used to, but I'm not really fully persuaded. Um, and we see him trying out. Uh, sort of progressively more ambitious acts of uh, acts of magic. That was a lot of fun, um, and, and I love the the stuff with the with the widow. One of the Hiram's um, Aaron's talked about Hiram needing to be right with God. The, the refrain that Hiram repeats is a chaste and sober mind. You have a chaste and sober mind, and in book two, uh, is his the chasteness of his mind is significantly distracted. <laughs> So that some of this stuff stops working, uh, and so a big part of that story in book two is um, the the transition of that father son relationship in a moment when it starts to become something closer to a peer relationship. And Hiram needs to rely on Michael, and Michael sees more of Hiram's point of view. And they don't end up in the same place, but there's this wonderful passage that Aaron wrote in one of the later chapters in the book where Hiram, they're kind of walking out of the desert, and Hiram sort of looks over at his son, and it reminds him of walking with his army buddies across the fields of France, right? And he's like, he's found, he's found a, in, in this new war he's fighting, he has found 
his his great buddy and it's his son. Very cool. Um, we do want to mention. Uh, I think uh, the Cunning Man's got a great cover by Dan Dos Santos, and it's really worth just buying the book for the cover. Frankly. Oh, totally. Uh, it's gorgeous. So uh, the cover has got. I, I, there's so many things I want to say about the cover. Um, it's we we got that cover as always. You know, Tony and 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 and, and Dan worked uh, this cover and just sprang it on us. Um, uh, so it's um, in many many ways it is technically wrong, but exactly perfect. Um, so just that's just one of uh, numerous examples, right? Is the hair is technically wrong because because Hiram's described as repeatedly repeatedly as having thin hair. One of the characteristic gestures is to raise his fedora hat and run his fingers through his. Uh, is deeply receding hair, which is something I'm sort of uh, something of an expert in. Is badly receding hair, <laughs> um, but uh, but on the cover he doesn't have that hair. But it's so it's so it's wrong. But it's also perfect because on the cover what he has is Superman hair. His hair is, is Clark Kent's hair. You look at the hair and it's that black, a little bit of a hint of blue with a big dominant curl on the forehead, right? And and that's and that's that's fantastic because it's a, it's a wonderful illusion to make because that's that's who Hiram is. He's not he's not a Kansas farmer, you know, but he's a, he's a character from the heartland and a character from the past and someone who is uh, who exists to do good in the world. And, and just so many of the little details on that cover are deeply evocative of what the book is about, even though they don't actually represent a scene. In the book, it's a, it's a terrific, uh, it's a terrific piece of art. Uh, I'm, he he sent a bunch of kind of co- uh, uh, comps, right? So he he had a, a number of ideas, and then he he chose the 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 one that's just perfect. But some of the other ones are just so moving and so beautiful. And so I, uh, as as a guy who's written a lot of books and I've had a lot of covers, some of them better than others, to to have these. Beautiful works of art based on a book I helped write was just very moving. I wept openly. Uh, I'm just dying to see what he's going to do for book two. Oh my god! Yeah. Well, we will know. Um, well, the book book one is out right now at booksellers everywhere, and that book is The Cunning Man by D.J. Butler and Aaron Michael Ritchie. So, David and Aaron, thank you so much for being with us and talking to us about The Cunning Man. Thank you. This has been great. Now we continue with the complete audiobook serialization of Son of the Black Sword by Larry Correa, book one in the saga of the Forgotten Warrior. After the War of the Gods, the demons were cast out and fell to the world. Mankind was nearly eradicated by the seemingly unstoppable beasts until the gods sent the great hero Ram Rowan to save them, he united the tribes, gave them magic, and drove the demons into the sea. But as centuries passed, the descendants of the great hero grew in number and power. They became tyrannical and cruel, and their religion nothing but an excuse for greed. The people rose up, and the surviving royalty and their priests were made castless, condemned to live as untouchables. The age of law had begun. Ashok Vidal has been chosen by a powerful ancient weapon to be its bearer. He is a protector, a member of an ancient military order of roving law enforcers. No one is more merciless in rooting out those who secretly practice the old ways as Ashok. But Ashok isn't who he thinks he is. And when he finds himself on the wrong side of the law, the consequences lead to rebellion, war, and perhaps transformation. Now here is the latest entry in Larry Correa's Son of the Black Sword. Chapter 43 At first the villagers of Jarlang had mistaken them for raiders from another house. It was an understandable error. At most, these workers had met a few Somsak at a time when they'd come to collect their rightful taxes. It had been generations since Jarlang had seen so many Somsak at once, and those had been raiders in the days before the Savage Mountain people had been defeated and made vassals to a bunch of farmers. 
How were they supposed to know the hundreds of terrifying warriors rapidly converging on their little village were of their same house? They'd meant no insult when they'd fled across their frozen fields. Only Nadan Somsak didn't see it that way. He took offense, and he was not the sort of man you wanted to give offense to. A few Thao warriors from the tiny local garrison were brought forward and shoved down in front of the line of stamping horses. The Somsak were truly frightening when they rode to battle, dressed in dyed furs and crow feathers tied over their gleaming mail. Where is the fallen? Nadan Somsak demanded. His words were nothing but a hissing whisper because of his new demon tongue. Where is Ashok Vadal? I don't know, mighty Thakur. Oh, how they recognized him now. Nadan made a growling noise that reverberated inside his helmet. Wrong answer. He lifted his powerful crossbow. The bolt was so quick that it was almost as if feathers sprouted from the warrior's eye socket. It only pierced the side of his brain, so death wasn't immediate. He rolled onto his back, gasping at the shaft, kicking and screaming as he tried to pluck it from his head. Nadan passed the crossbow over to one of his men so it could be reloaded. The Somsak crossbows were unwieldy things that required a lever to draw them back, but they were extremely powerful. Where is he? The next Thao warrior in line wasn't eager to die. Last I saw, he was at the bridge, defending the castler's quarter. If you knew it was the Fallen, why didn't you capture him? Nardon asked as one of his soldiers passed him another loaded crossbow. The Somsak's horse stomped nervously as blood stink hit its nostrils. The warrior was choking on the words, struggling to get them out in time. He drew that magic sword, Thakur. He hesitated, probably trying to think of a response that wouldn't incriminate him as a coward. His eyes flicked over to his thrashing compatriot. We had no... Since his head was turned to look at his dying companion, Nadan shot that one through the ear canal. This time, death was instantaneous. Sakaso shook his head at the display. Theoretically, they were of the same house, and the Thao were of higher status, but the tattooed mountain thugs didn't see it that way. Not today, at least. Perhaps it was the boiling hatred that came from the demon blood now coursing through Nadan's veins. Or perhaps he was just always that much of a barbarian at heart, but Sikasso could already tell that the day would end in slaughter. Ashok defends the untouchables here. All he defends, I will destroy. Fourth Paltan, burn the castless quarter. Kill them all. Third, search the workers' homes in case this coward was incorrect. The rest will remain with me. As soon as he is found, alert me. Nadan ordered as he was presented another loaded crossbow. Go. His damaged tongue didn't carry his words far, but his officers repeated them down the line until the units broke off, riding through the icy lanes. The majority of the Somsak remained just outside the village, ready to swoop in the moment their target was seen. Sakasa noted that Nadan had sent off the unseasoned and restless youths to cause trouble, while keeping the obviously experienced veterans close. A wise move. He watched the warriors. Most of them seemed ready for a fight, almost as eager as their Thakur. There was a lot of stored aggression in these mountains, and for too long the Somsak had been vassals to a house that they secretly considered to be their inferiors. Before they'd ridden forth, Nadan had addressed his officers, speaking of how it was time for them to gain a new ancestor blade and become a great house again. They had heard the Thakur's new voice and thought it was a miracle. At Sikasso's suggestion, he'd not let them see his face. Most were thankful for this miracle. Sikasso had noticed a lot of superstitious glances in his direction, not all of the Somsak were bloodthirsty fools. 
and the observant already sensed that there was something seriously wrong about their thakur. No matter how great Nadan was in battle, once they discovered the truth of their leader's miraculous healing, there would be violence. Even the most pragmatic warriors would never accept a thakur tainted by forbidden demon magic. If Sikasa was going to be among these people, he'd have to watch his back, because it was easier to lash out at the wizard who'd corrupted Jothakur than the beloved and extremely deadly man himself. But he doubted their alliance would last long enough for it to be an issue. The wizards of the Lost House were already perched like falcons in the rocks above, ready to swoop in and secure the sword. Whatever Somsak were left when Ashok was done with them, his men would dispose of. And then the lost house could disappear back into myth and legend where they belonged. There was quite a bit of screaming coming from the workers' homes. Apparently, to the Somsag, the command search was a synonym for rape and pillage. Thankfully, the warrior who'd been shot in the eye had quit his crying and bled to death. The horses were agitated, and Sikasso had to struggle to control his mount. Even the hardy mountain animals were struggling on this ice. They'd been in such a hurry to get here that one rider had tumbled over a cliff, and there'd been a few other slips, crashes, and broken legs, but most of them had made it. Their horses were such an agile breed that the Somsak must have crossed them with mountain goats. But they still weren't real war horses trained to crash into combat, so the smells and noises were frightening them. He got the animal calmed down and went back to surveying the humble village. Once he had a moment to collect himself, Sikasa began to feel a vibrant energy in the air. There was strong magic here. At first he thought it had to be Angruvedal, but there was something else, something different. He'd been near Angruvedal before, and while it was truly a masterpiece, this was an entirely new sensation. It was very different than demon, and didn't feel quite like black steel. It was unlike any magic he'd ever felt before, and it was so powerful it made the hairs on his arms stand up. There was something strange going on in Jarlang, and Sukaso vowed to get to the bottom of it. As soon as he could slip away, he'd inform his wizards to search for whatever was causing that sensation. What luck! He'd come here for Angruvedal, but if they could capture it along with something else... Sikasso grinned at the thought. That morning he'd thought of his men as addicts, and there was nothing more exciting to an addict than a new drug. Nadan Somsak was eyeing the village. His helmet was an armored bucket with vision slits and elk antlers. Which was good, because Sikasa wasn't sure how his flesh would react as the demon took it over. Nadan put his hands on the helmet and began to lift. I would caution you against taking that off, Thakur, the wizard said. My throat burns, my guts churn, all I can taste is metal. It takes time for my magic to work. You will look like your old self soon enough, but right now, your appearance may be unsettling to your men. In truth, Sukasa wasn't sure what it was going to do to him. Every man's reaction was different when the demon got into their blood. Usually it took a day or two before the user became too hideous to pass for human, but for someone who barely qualified as human to begin with, perhaps the transformation would go much quicker. What have you done to me? I've given you the strength to crush Ashok Vidal like a bug. That was another entry in the complete audiobook serialization of Son of the Black Sword by Larry Correa. And that's it for the podcast. Thanks to Audible.com. Thanks to podcast theme composer Ruth Judkowitz and a bowl of dusty magic gleaned from the tornadoes of Oklahoma, which are actually dimension-hopping beasts from a world where winds are memories and zephyrs are 
rather risque fantasies, by the way. Plus thanks and praise to DJ Butler and Aaron Michael Ritchie, authors of The Cunning Man. Please join us next time here at the hammering heart of science fiction and fantasy and keep reaching for the stars. Thank you.